recently I made this Ableton course and with this webinar I wanted to show like a couple of things that um, that helped me while preparing my set for Ableton so I want to um, I want to show the live set that I have I want to show some of the the things that I came across some of the uh, tools that I used in the meantime if you guys have questions you can always ask away and I can answer them uh, uh, probably sort of on the fly um, but basically I wanted to talk let's start start all the way at the beginning so when I started my live uh, performance with Ableton Quest I saw this video from I think it was no such thing and he was performing with this um, MPD 32 MIDI controller and to me that was the coolest thing ever I didn't know you could work just with a computer and then get this whole sort of sound of a complete band so i thought wow i need to get that controller and then i got the controller and i got ableton i sort of plucked the two together and i expected to be i thought nice now i can be i can be this guy i can make amazing music and then i found out that there's actually a lot of things that you need to that you need to know in order to actually do that a lot of different approaches and ableton like it's already in the name, Ableton Live, so you expect that you launch it and then you can sort of go about it. But then when you start watching videos of people, then you see they use vastly different approaches. Like some people use the uh, just the arrangement window, other, other people use the session view. So I had to go through a lot of things actually to find my approach. Um, one thing, like first I started with that MPD controller and then I found that it was actually, like I still don't know exactly how, how no such thing used it. Um, I think he had, he had a lot of things pre-set up and then a lot of MIDI mapping. Um, but for me, I felt like I needed a different, more advanced controller, but then I found I still lacked some control. So I got into the Ableton scripting side of life. Then I got into Max for Life because I felt that would give me more power as well. So those are some some of the things that I want to talk about today. The different options that you can choose and the different controllers that you can have. Just out of curiosity, um, are any of you guys already uh, playing out with Ableton, like playing live? And also, which which controllers are are you guys using? Um, Jake says, yes, nice, the APC 40. So I just, that's the thing. I only got the APC 40, the Mark II that you see here on the background. I got that yesterday. And <laughs> this, before that I used all sorts of different controllers with, with different options, but with this one, it's definitely a very easy one. So if any any of you guys are thinking about starting with Ableton and you're you're not you don't really want to deal with either MIDI mapping or weird kind of scripting stuff, then then to me this was like the cheapest option to get there. Um, but before, when like back in the days, like and any day before yesterday, when I still didn't have this controller. Um, I found there are other ways as well to make your regular old MIDI controller work. And this is one of the things that I, I talk about in the course because like you have these, um, actually I should, let me do a share screen, share screen. And let's see if we can look at Ableton. Um, this made me lose my chat. Let me check, where's my chat there. Um, so you guys can see this right now, I hope. Oh, uh, Novation, that's a very nice controller as well. They have that auto auto map thing. Yeah, so one of the things when you're, when you're getting these controllers is that they sort of all work differently and you have a couple of them that are supported or actually it's, it's quite a list. Um, it's this list right here. So if you go to the Ableton preferences, you can see like all of these controllers there, they're sort of, they have a script that is pre-designed to work with Ableton. So Ableton has an API and I don't want to get too much into the technical stuff unless there are like, like questions about that. But basically the way Ableton works is just, you have the software and then there's the backside of Ableton. And this is the, the area that controllers connect to. And it's actually very different 
from how a lot of other DAOs are doing that. So what the developer of the of the controller will do is they will make a script which communicates with Ableton through the sort of back door, the API they call that. Um, with that, you get a lot more power than just general MIDI mapping. Um, one thing, for example, that allows you to do is have uh, shift functionality or get this grid selected. Like this is one you can see. I hope you guys can see this pink ring right here. That's the, the they call that the, the grid selector or there's um, a session, session ring is the more official name. Um, um, this is one of the things that you can never get with MIDI mapping because with MIDI mapping, what you do is you guys are probably all familiar with this. You press your command M and you hit a button on your controller and then it maps that button. So I can hit a key on one of my keyboards such as this one. And then I can see the MIDI channel 14 and then the note that I hit, which happened to be a C. So that's nice, but then if you want to launch all of these clips, you have to, I mean, you need a lot of buttons. So this is one of those, those session rings is one of the great things because what you can do is you can move it around like so, and all the APC guys will notice. And then whatever clip you launch will be within that grid. So it's, it's much more flexible. And this is the functionality that I wanted to get for my own controller. And this works via Python scripts. And that's what these scripts are as well. So when you choose a controller here, actually what you're doing is you're choosing a, a script that, that sort of sets itself in between the controller that you have, which you choose in the input and output, and then Ableton. So that helps to translate the messages that are coming from your controller into Ableton. So I would say one of the first things to get familiar with if you're, if you're really new to performing is actually MIDI and MIDI messages and, and how it works. Like one thing you're probably gonna find at some point is that you can only use a MIDI message to do one specific thing because if you assign it twice, um, you can ac accidentally do two things at the same time by pressing one button. So one application that I always recommend to start with is this um, MIDI monitor application. And what it does is if you hit a key somewhere, uh, we can hopefully hear that sound there as well. Let me know if, if you didn't, I, I heard a sound at least. Um, but if I press a key there, you can see what kind of message comes in. So you can see a note on message on channel 14, and then with a specific CC number, which in this case, is the note number. And then the last value here is the velocity. So this, this is all that, that it sends to Ableton. It's just a very, like MIDI is nothing else than just a, a text command. And then Ableton needs to decide what to do with it. Um, so this is how we can map various things. Um, but let's, yeah, let's actually go over the, um, yeah, this, so this monitor uh, responding to a question here is just called MIDI monitor. Um, and it's it's a free application you can download. I think it's by this company called Snoys. Yeah, a Snoys production, and it's free. And I know on Windows you have alternatives as well. Um, and it's just very handy because you can check here the MIDI sources. So these are all the things that I've connected to my computer right now, all the MIDI devices. And then you can see what a certain thing sends. And this can be very handy when you have, um, especially when you start to have multiple controllers, you want to make sure that the, that the data is always on um, different, uh, different channels. You want to make sure that you have no identical messages coming from two different controllers. And one of, one of the tricky things there is that a lot of controllers by default, they will send on MIDI channel one. So if you have multiple, you probably want to set them up to, to different channels. Um, but without going too far into that, 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 that was sort of how I started. And then I found that that controller that I saw online that I thought it would, it would make my life great and solve all my problems. It didn't really do that. It had a control mode, but it's, it was very limited. I could only sort of press play and then press stop. And then that was it. And that's usually not enough. Um, so then I got a different controller, the Livid Base 2 controller. Um, it's not a very well known. I have it here on, on a shelf somewhere, but I'm, I'm too lazy to get it. It's now has been replaced with the APC 
So I made a script for that, a Python script, um, which took a lot of time to learn. And this is actually, I thought it was necessary for some reason. I thought, okay, I need to learn this as well. That way I can really customize. It's, it's sort of the same mindset as the people that feel that they need to make every sound themselves uh, up until the kicks and the snare drums, because then it's sort of your own. I had a little bit of that, uh, of that thing, uh, how do you call that, pitfall maybe. Um, so I thought I need to write my own script. That was a very great idea. It took a lot of time. Eventually I learned Python and that was fun, but it, it took me a year to even start to perform out live. Um, but an easier way to do that, let's say you have a controller and it's not really supported by Ableton, are these uh, user scripts. And user scripts are a way to, to tell something to Ableton without having to write actual code. So I can show you, actually, um, let me show you one thing here. This is kind of interesting. And then we'll go to something more, more useful. But if you uh, go into your application folder and you have your Ableton application and you right click on that and you do your show package contents and Windows is in a different location. Um, but then if you go to app resources and MIDI remote scripts, these are those, those scripts that actually nest themselves in between your controller and Ableton. And you can make your own script for this. It's a lot of Googling and a lot of figuring out. Um, but that's, that's what I did just to, just to show you. It looks, uh, can we see that somewhere? Yeah, it looks like this. It's a whole mess. You don't really want to get into that unless you're, unless that's your kind of thing. You can do very cool stuff with it because you have full access on, on Ableton. Uh, but it isn't especially necessary because there's another way that I want to show you in a second as well. But if you don't want to deal with that, which I would really understand, um, you can go with user scripts. And let me see if I can still locate those. These are scripts that are in your library folder and they're just text based. Um, let me see where those actually I need to. Um, it's probably in your audio audio library folder. I'm Googling this right now. <laughs> um, yeah, library preferences, Ableton Live. There, Ableton, then you choose your version, probably the latest one. And then here you have this user remote script. Um, um, normally this comes up with just these two files. So I made this folder myself. And if you read the how to, it sort of explains you how you can map certain things without having, having to MIDI learn them. So it explains you exactly how this works. And then what you end up with is a text file where you assign certain things, like for example, the pad one note, and then you give it a CC number here of your controller. So this is where that MIDI monitor comes in very nicely because you can open it up and then let's clear this and then you can press a note or you can change the button. You can see the channel and then the CC number, and then you could assign that using this function right here. And the benefit of that is that if you start Ableton, you can you can choose this user script and it will just always work. So um, you don't have to MIDI map anything and it works in all these new, like if you start a new project, it will, it will instantly work. That's a very nice thing. Um, and the other, of course, starting method is to just MIDI learn things like pressing Command M and then assigning it to a button or a knob. Um, yeah, so that's sort of how I started. And I started with these with these user scripts and I, I thought it was pretty fun. But then I saw some other controllers that had some very nice functionality as well, like the, like the push and stuff like that. And I couldn't really do that. So this is why I eventually landed with this, with this APC controller, which, because it just, it has sort of all the things that you, that you want to get access to right away. Um, so then let's, let's go to the, the actual, the actual music side of things. So when it came to my music, I had a little bit of an issue of 
I, I found it very difficult to think about how I was going to perform that. Um, mainly because my music is kind of weird by nature. It's a little bit cinematic and it has a lot of uh, tempo changes and key signature changes. And one of my first problems was that I didn't really know what to do. Like it was already very dense music and a lot of effects and stuff. And I felt like, well, all the things, all the filter sweeps, all the flangers, I've, if I wanted, if I wanted that, like I had made it in the track already. So if there was a point where there was like a big build up, and I might, I might want to take the low frequencies away to to um, unfilter those back on the drop, so that you know feels more impressive to create that contrast. In like in pretty much all cases, I already did that in the track, so I, I found it difficult to to play around with that, um, and I felt like what. I, I cannot fake it. I cannot just press play and then wait for, uh, yeah, and then just wait until the track ends and then do some sort of a transition. You want something to do. So I found that we're talking with a lot of people as well that this really depends on the genre. Like if you are making sort of typical EDM and that kind of stuff, there's actually a lot you can do with playing around with different loops. So you can have, for example, uh, the drums of your track and then you have your bass and then your melody and then maybe your your lead sounds and you have them all separated, which is what I have right here. So you can see um, here, for example, I just have drums. Can we hear that? Um, there. Um, and then I have my basses and then my melodies and stuff like that. Um, so that is that is one way you can separate it. But with with more complex genres, it's it's more difficult to mix in different loops. So if you do like uh, techno or or EDM or uh, pop, even um, what you can do, and I do this sometimes still with with more straightforward sections, is I create multiple layers that work together really well. So you could have, for example two or three or even four drum groups with different loops or topper loops work really well. They don't have low frequencies, so you can layer them on top of things to get a different sense of rhythm. Uh, that can be a very effective approach for that. But for me, I felt like that didn't really work with my music. So what I ended up doing was I took all the main melodies out and all the all the lead sounds and the things that, that I thought would be very interesting to play myself, I took out of the track. And then I practiced those melodies, I made new sounds for them, and then I play those on top of my music live. So actually my live set involves a lot of, a lot of playing with a lot of different patch changes so that whenever a new section comes, I can play that with a new sound. Um, so this is sort of my approach, and it's one of the things that I show in the in the course as well. Um, but there's, yeah, like I said, there's there's many different things you can do. Another thing that I've seen uh, people do is to create, um, to use, to have their tracks in clips, like what you see right now. So a clip, just to clarify, is just maybe an eight bar loop, and it plays the the. This could be like the, the full intro of your track. So we have a scene right here. And if I press this scene launch button, it's gonna play everything in this uh, row, I should say. And then it sort of progresses downwards, right? I think most of you are familiar with that. Um, so what I've seen people do is they have, they have that going on, but they also sample their track inside the sample rack. So now they can play around with their track, but within the sample rack or drum rack, they can launch different sections for, from their same tracks and then launch them on top of each other. Another approach is to have a lot of loops on the side. So you can have a couple extra tracks in here that have drum loops and percussion effects and leads that are in the same key as, as that track is. And then you can sort of mix and match with that. And this is also great with something like the ABC. This is why it has those pads is because you can launch multiple clips at the same time within a, within a certain um, window or view that you're in. So this is what, what that change selected job does. 
or, or a chain selector, I mean the session ring. So just to give you an example of that, I could launch, for example, this drum clip right here. I could test that out with this bass line right here and then with that lead, uh, something like this. <laughs> what you see a lot of those you know the guys that are doing the very uh, like trigger finger and those very fast sort of they're able to push guys they like this a lot as well like you have um sort of different different clips and then you mess around with that by just triggering them and the trigger rate usually is set at the top right here where you can set it to re-trigger every 60 note or every bar um so there's like this there's also a distinction here between wanting to play your own tracks and just jamming out live if you're going to jam out live you you would just have a lot of different clips and things that sound nice together it's sort of a different approach than than playing full tracks and wanting to make a transition between the tracks as well um so one thing um for example that was the problem for me is that because i'm i'm playing all the time uh, with piano usually both hands it's tricky to do other stuff as well and this is where i needed to find a a new solution and one of the solution is dummy clips so what dummy clips are is, is a clip that has a certain instruction or automation to do a certain thing at a certain moment and this um, can be really handy if you if you're using follow action so let's actually um let's actually go to a section right here maybe this one I should probably go there with the APC as well. So we can scroll this wing down. Uh, you can hold shift and it goes down a little bit faster. Let's see. Yes. So follow actions, what they are. And I will put this guy a little bit closer. They basically tell something, they tell Ableton what's going to happen after a clip has started playing. So here you can see on my drum track, if I go to the, uh, if I go to the sort of detailed view, if I enable, uh, I think it's this one, no, this one right here, we can see the follow actions and we can see that this one after eight bars, so the first number here is a bar, is going to go to the next clip. And this is very handy if you don't have hands free to do something. So this will happen for all the clips in this row. After eight bars, they will progress to the next clip. And this is where dummy clips come in handy because you can create an empty track in Ableton. I have two sort of empty tracks right here that just have notes. One of them has notes and the other one has instructions for Ableton. Um, and they will, they will launch in order. So here, for example, I have the instruction to reset some effects in Ableton. And here I have an instruction to uh, lo load a specific patch in Ableton as well. You can either do this with Ableton native functions and automation, like you could write automation in here and then send it to some parameter, or you could do that with uh, Cliffix, which is what I'm doing. So in this scenario, um, because I'm playing piano, I want the first parts of this, this set to sort of progress without me doing anything. And uh, you can see that if I launch this first scene, that the next scene, it will start to blink, showing that that's the one that's going to play after this one. So let's do that. Actually, I'll lower the volume a little bit. So this is the intro of one of my tracks and I need to play piano here normally. With two hands and that's why I don't really have time to uh, play the, the scene after that here. Actually, I need to play another. cannot explain and play piano at the same time but i need to play something on top of this um it's coming very stage. um and in this case i'm using the cliffx for that and um, cliffx is a set 
um, of scripts and uh, we can use it via these these um, clips right here so for example this one here it, it sends an instruction to test right on the first part here which is my my um, keyboard um, on track six uh, for the fourth here um, set the first parameter so if we go to that track um, we can see that there's a couple of devices on here but on the fourth device this is actually my instrument rack and the first parameter here is this chain selector and you can see that it indeed has a value of 16 and this is how I play or sequence different sounds so this is what I use to switch sometimes I'm going to sound 19 then to 21 um, etc just to be able to have a different sound here so let's actually see um, after the scene right here is gonna Ableton is gonna switch or this device rack is gonna switch from a piano sound to a more pad kind of so let's check that real Basically, the approach it goes from like it can go from different sounds. It can switch between different sounds. We can do a lot more. It can um, also reset device racks, or it can set fader levels lower. It can change the BPM, which is what I'm doing right here. I'm setting the BPM to uh, 78. Um, okay, I see a question here. Why? Do you have clips in your session and follow actions if you could have an arrangement and also play piano on top of it? Yeah, so that's that's an interesting thing. Like you could, um, like what some people are doing, like this um, Anomaly guy, for example, I think a great, great performer with Ableton Live, def definitely one to check out. Um, I know he uses the arrangement window a lot, and there's some advantages to that. Like one of the advantages that you can, so arrangement window, just to be clear, that's this guy, where we have everything in a, um, how do you call it, horizontal fashion, I guess, linear, I don't know. Um, but you could use this as well, and then just hit play here, and it's gonna, <laughs> linear, yeah. And it's gonna, it's gonna play through. And then one of the nice things is that you can have automation sort of, on the like like in your session right here and in in clip view you can do automation as well but it has to be in between clips so we have our clip envelopes here and we can write automation within this audio clip but it's tricky if you have longer automations because these are all like in a lot of cases these are just like four or eight bars long um so what i see a lot of bands do is actually work in this section right here in this part um, because then the whole band can listen to the click track they know exactly where they are in the song and they um it's a little bit more straightforward and also easier to think about at first the reason i didn't do that to, to finally answer the question is um because i wanted i wanted the flexibility of of being able to go like back and forth and change things up quite a lot so being able to to quickly go to a different scene and then quickly go back um, that's one of the reasons that i that i prefer this um, clip view or session view um, and the other the other thing is that um, it's sort of for me at least it's 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 easier to see and it and um, it's also easier to to stack things like the other thing is that for me, for example, when you're when you're making a set, you have this sort of order of songs in mind, and and you might wanna you 
like you might want to experiment with that order a little bit and later it might change so what i can do in here is i i sort of have my songs in here, but i can go infinitely down um and here are all the other things that i experiment with and that i that i try out if you do this on in this linear view like this you're going to get a very long track and it becomes difficult to navigate uh, one other thing that i really like which is very handy is that you can write the bpm and um, the key signature even like here within this um within this scene launch as they call it so if i hit this button it's going to automatically set my bpm to to the correct one and it's get uh, it's going to get this um time signature i said key signature right it's it's going to set the time signature to the correct value as well um there's that plus the fact that just most controllers are are focused on this like for example if you have that apc with with the whole fancy grid launch and stuff uh, that's not gonna be of much use here um so yeah so that's that's why i'm using the and i think I would say 80% of people are using this. And mostly when I see the arrangement window, it's for um, it's for people that are, are playing with bands because they're maybe also because they're used to that kind of that kind of thing. Um, right, so that's uh, let's see, that, that's a little bit about uh, CliffX. I don't wanna um, I don't wanna go too much into depth about that. Actually, let me let me explain two sort of important concepts first. So the first one are device racks. And I mentioned this in the course as well. So device racks are the effects that you're going to use. So to give you an example of what an effect sounds like, like this here. A beat repeat. Uh, some distortion. distortion, some really aggressive distortion, uh, some delay, bass, etc. So I have all, all these things that I can use on my track. And to me, this is a very, this is an important step because these things like these create new sounds, right? And and sound is really what, what makes, what distinguishes, kind of yeah, distinguishes you from somebody else. So, um, what I recommend in the course as well is spend some time with with effects and try to get like effects that really sound like you that sound like your songs as well. Like these are all things that can make your life set a lot more personal and a lot more unique. So the way this works, and I think this is something most of you guys know as well. But if we go to the audio effects section here, we have this audio effect rack and if we load that somewhere we get this basically empty thing where it says that it needs more effects um and then you control all your effects in here and then if you click this stop button right here you get your macro controls and macro controls in a lot of synths and a lot of uh, daws are just controls that are, are um able to control multiple other parameters which is very handy in a live scenario because you might want one knob to do multiple things like for example increase the resonance on an eq but then also lower the filter cutoff or something like that um so that's what you can do with effect racks and then you can set up your own custom effect can be third-party stuff as well and sort of map that to these eight easy to use macros and this is another one of those things that a lot of controllers are adapted to so for example with this apc here if i click on this you can see the little blue hand there and that means that this is now the active device and that means that my eight knobs here they're gonna map to that device so i'm i'm able to control those knob with the apc but then i can press i can go to the next device like this and then I can control that one. And this is something that's not very easy to do with the MIDI learn because you can MIDI learn like one parameter at a time. So it doesn't actually recognize which, which is the active device. Um, and that's, that's something that you can do with the script. Um, but basically what I did is I spent a lot of time making these and I'm still swapping out things and trying different approaches. Um, usually I have two per, uh, two per track. So I have this this sound design rack, as I call it here, and then I have this standard rack. And this is much more of the standard 
things that you use to to spice up things a little bit, but not completely mess them up, I guess. So let's actually, um, let's sh show this on the master. I have this here on my master channel as well. I can play this scene right here. Or actually let's go with a, um, maybe this. And then I'll first show the standard rack, which, which um, yeah, let's, I'll just show it. Right, so the, most of these are just, they're just like standard DJ effects. Um, I would call them. And then um, I have my other rack. And this is really to to either destroy or completely sustain a sound, um, make a sound longer, which is a very handy thing because if you are able to extend a, a section, let's say you have the outro of one song and you need a little bit of time to go to the next song. Maybe you need to increase the BPM. Maybe um, it's all the way down. So you need to scroll all the way down. With these effects, um, they're they're more creative and and a lot of them they create sort of a washy sound so that i could play this um take one of these effects so now the signal is sort of frozen and i can click on a new i can click on a new scene and then unfilter it and unfreeze it again sort of made a transition. Uh, you can skip a lot of things at once. So a lot of these effects are based on that. I have a, a granular one, a granular delay, grain delay, which is a delay that pitches up the um, pitches up the delay. So it's, it's a very bright delay. I can show that. Actually, I'll show all of them in order. The, the titles are pretty straightforward here. But... <laughs> This just allows me to do a whole bunch of uh, messy stuff. So let's actually take a look into one of these. Um, so first we have a chain selector right here. Right now I'm only using one. Uh, we'll get to a chain selector a little bit later. Um, but then I have all the effects in there. And I think for this one, this was the standard rec, right? Yeah, I'm mostly using standard Ableton effects. One thing that's that's great about using these effect racks as well is that, as you can see right now, all of my effects are switched off. And that's because this on off button is mapped to one of these macros right here. And you can see everything that's mapped has this green dot right here. And if we click on map, we can actually see all the assignments. So a great thing here, let's, let's try the phaser, for example. The phaser, what it will do is as soon as I turn this knob, um, it will it will turn on the effect and if we look in the mapping and we click on this we can see why that is it says that all right if this macro has a value of one as we can see right there then it's going to switch it on so if it, it has a value of one or more it's going to switch it on um, and this is great for your cpu because basically in this whole set there's a lot of a lot of effect racks with a lot of different effects in them and some really heavy third-party effects as well um, but with this approach, it only switches on the effect when you use it. So it also only um, uses, like takes up CPU power when you use it. If all these are down, then it's it's not costing me any CPU. So you can see that even though this is a pretty uh, pretty massive set, I, the CPU is, is still all right. Um, so here we can see that this, so the, the first thing it does, it switches on that effect and then it just increases the dry wet of the phaser. A uh, very simple one. Uh, chorus is similar. Um, let's go actually to the EQ. Um, let's say combination. Oh, yeah, it's right here. So we can see we have um, one low pass. And what I want, like normally, of course, this is a little bit weird um, when you 
when the low pass is normally down, you, you would hear no sound, but I inverted this behavior because usually what I want is that if all my macros are down, um, it, it doesn't do anything. So if, if we go into the mapping right here um, and we click on this low pass guy or actually this low pass guy, you can see that the value here is in, inverted. So by default, it would come up like this. And then if I, um, if this is down, the EQ is down as well. So now if I play this, let's see which track are we on? I don't even know. Oh, we're on the master. Um, so if I play this now, it's completely low pan, and that's not a, what I want. I want the effect always to be more if I increase the parameter. So that's why uh, you can invert these and then you can say, all right, it's gonna go from 10 Hertz to uh, 22. Okay. Um, all right, and then we have the high pass and the resonance. And the resonance, this one works for both. So you can see that I'm using a separate EQ for the high pass. I have one for the low pass and one for the high pass. Um, that's just so that I can use them at the same time. Um, and then the resonance is mapped to both of them. So this is another handy thing with macros. You can map it to multiple parameters. Um, this is actually a pretty straightforward rack. And then if we get into the sound design kind of rack, there's lots of weird stuff going on here. I'm uh, embarrassed to show this actually. So one thing that I use here is because you sort of go through these effect racks quite a lot and you try out different things, um, you're going to end up with probably multiple effect racks that do like cool things. So here what I did is I combined those multiple effect racks into another rack. So this is these are called nested devices and it's when you have an effect rack inside an effect rack and you can continue doing that. You can have an effect rack in an effect rack in an effect rack. So that's what's happening here. So you can see that this granular, like this is the top level, the, the parent effect rack and this granular knob is controlling this other effect rack. And then if you open that up, you can see the effects in there. And you can see that this is actually uh, guitar rig with a lot of mess in there and a lot of different controls mapped. Um, the nice thing about this approach as well is that you can um, take some pre-made effect racks, like there's uh, a bunch of great ones to find online and you can just load them in another one and just use one of the parameters for that. Um, like this one, for example, I downloaded from probably this website and it's just a looper effect rack and it has a macro in there so this is all the way mapped um, to this loop right here so that's a very handy approach and then let's also take a look at instrument racks because they're very similar um, you have your you have your macros right here as well and this time i'm not really using them but with this what we can do is we can have multiple the synths or multiple sounds um, within within one channel. So when you have multiple sounds at the same, like multiple synth sounds loaded, um, of course you want to be able to control when you're you're going to use which one. And there are multiple ways here to to set that. So one of them is using a key tracker. So here what you can do is here at the, at the bottom we see all the sounds that we have, and I can tell them which in which frequency ranges they they work so if i do something like this this first sound this m plug sound is only going to trigger when i play those those very low notes right there um so you can set set them all up in different octaves which is something sometimes what i do um and then you can split it by velocity as well so if you play louder louder it's gonna uh, trigger a specific sound if you play softer it's gonna trigger another sound um, the thing I prefer for this live set is to use the chain selector. And chain selector, I think you guys are familiar with it, but it just plays the sound that this little blue line is on top of. And this is what I've mapped to macro one. So if you, if you right click, you can map that to a certain macro. So with this, I can just choose any sound I want. So I can go here and I can play, let's see if this works now because I did mess around with it a little bit. that so this is our, our way to to go through our sounds and we can just automate that within a clip so 
if you go if you create an empty clip on this channel and you open the envelopes you can see right now because it's the last uh, touched parameter we can see the chain selector right here we can actually write automation for that um, so that way you can you can switch to different sounds and indeed um, to um, this is going to save a lot of CPU as well because what you can do with this as well is if we go into the mapping here you can see that only the instruments that i use are switched on so for example if the chain selector is on a value of 22 then it will play this sound here it's the last and the 22 20 second sound um, and only then will this be enabled so even though we have lots of different sins in there um, they will only be they will only be enabled when i play them um, so that that way yeah you save a lot of resources and then to go one level deeper what i often do is rather than just having a synth in here just to show you by the way what that looks like so let's say i want to add another sound to this what i could do is let's go with something ableton -y, like this new awesome wave tool well not so new anymore i can add this to my list right here um, we have to wait a little bit and it shows up it gives this little blue thingy right here um, i want to set that up in slot 23 because it's unused and then what i can do is i can go into the mapping and i can say um, i can map this here this on off button of the synth and we'll map that to the chain selector so it now maps this on off to this little blue guy there and then you can say all right when when the value of the chain selector is 23 then you can turn on my synth so now if i um, look at that it will be off all the time until i hit a value of 23 and then um, it will enable it should enable if i did it well maybe i didn't do it well let's see Let's try 24. That works. We get some nice sine waves or squares. Um, so that's a very handy thing. And um, often what I will do is let's remove this. I will actually have another instrument rack um, within this instrument rack because then I can do still do the key split thing. So here we need to make an option whether we use key split, velocity split, or whether we we don't use any of that stuff. Um, but when you take another instrument rack and you load it as an instrument, you get that same system again. So um, I have this section right here. I believe it's right here. Um, yeah, this one where I have... Um, multiple sounds layered uh, on my keyboard so i have a bass oh, actually it's the wrong wrong section uh, let me check where is that this one ah no i know what went wrong i went up a couple of octaves okay let's try this again yeah, so here I have my acoustic bass. And I can play the bass line of the track with that. And in the middle I have, so that's, um, let's see which sound are we on? I think this one is tricky to see with those very small ones. Yeah, so here I can see that in my lower octave, I have this bass sound. Then in the middle of the keyboard, I have these chord sounds. A little bit flumey, and then at the top I have this just lead sound. Um, so this way, if if I play around with this section, and it probably is gonna go really bad, but I can I can show you how to use this different different sound. really fun to play around with like be able to play around with different sounds live and you can really you can really spice up your tracks that way um 
Let's see, this, uh, is that everything I want to say about instruments? Probably, yeah, I have, you know, uh, I have this, there's always lots of fun stuff. Like here, after my instrument, I have these, these same racks as well. And I have a looper, device. let's actually really quickly talk about the looper device because it's really fun as well. So what I can do with that is I have that map to my MIDI keyboard and this is just a MIDI map. So if we do command M, you can see the buttons that I, that I uh, assigned to my controller. And now what I can do is let's let's solo this track just for that purpose. Um, I could record something and let's enable an arpeggiator as well. And then I can record that. After which I can do a lot of other fun stuff. Like I can increase the speed. Or I can lower it, also making it lower in pitch. And then I could add my effects to that. moment to go to a completely different section of the track because now this is playing so so i have sort of a sound going on this is just the same thing where you where you want to sustain a certain sound or you, you want to lengthen a certain section so what i could do right now is on um on all the other tracks i could now be filtered down um, or i could just stop the clips on the other tracks so i can press stop here and press stop here like this is all safe because I have some sound going on. It's filtered right now. We can get it back a little bit. Let's see, it's right here. And then we can start playing somewhere else. And then we can filter the rest of the tracks up again if you filter them down. And then you've sort of successfully made a transition. So let's try that. Let's filter this, these guys on solo this track and then we can filter in our drums for example Just those those loopers. They're a nice way to to you can you can use this with any audio as well. So you can take a section of your song, loop it, go to a different section, and then just switch the loop off again. Um, so I use it for my live playing because it's kind of a nice thing to be able to do. And um, I often come up with a lot of new sounds through that as well. And that was accidental, which is a nice thing. Um, so since we're running close to our uh, to our one hour, um, I want to end with questions, which is appropriate because I'm getting a question right now. The step sequencer or sequencer within your custom looper? Oh yeah, yeah I named it custom looper, but it's not really uh, it's not really that custom. Um, but the the step sequencer, if if I get you correctly, um, you mean those different divisions that we see. So that's what you, like you can set that right here. You you first set the um, the recording length. So in my case, I always record four length loops. So 
that's why as soon as I hit record, the quantization here is set to one bar. So if the sequencer is playing, which it is right now, you see that at the top, if I press this at a random moment, it's gonna wait to the next bar before it starts recording. You can see first that red dot starts flashing and then it starts to record. And then here we just see quarter notes. So we get four times four quarter notes making four bars. Um, and then if, after it's done playing, it's gonna, um, it's gonna uh, repeat that back to us. So that's what we see here. We see record four bars, then play. You can also give a different action right here. Um, so this is just where you, where you see where the loop is in time, which is, can be a handy visual reference um, because you, if you record, you want to sort of be able to know how, how long it's recording, especially if you don't have anything playing in the background. So what I did actually for that is I have a record button on my, on my keyboard and if I press that, it's going to start recording but it will also switch to the track and that's because I've set this record button um, I've set this up to, to this effect, the title of this effect, you can see it right here. And Ableton, in that case, if you do that, it will automatically switch to that device. So let's say you wanna see a device as soon as you use it, you can just click on the, on the device header, like in this case, your custom looper. Um, and then you map that same button to that. So that button 13, um, channel 13, uh, CC number 75, is mapped to this, but also to the record button. So then if I press record, I automatically see the device. And then because it has that thing that um, kind of looks like a step sequencer, although it's a little bit different, um, I can see that right away. I can see where I am in the loop. And then the other thing as to changing the speed, um, I've, I think there's yeah, these two I've mapped. Um, the multiply, like you can see them here. This goes an uh, octave up and down. And then um, I also map this reverse button. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, so that's, that's basically how I use that. And then I have one more button to clear. So this takes quite a lot of MIDI assignments here. Um, it takes a record, it takes a clear, it takes a, some buttons to, to move this. And then as for the uh, arpeggiating the notes, that's an actual arpeggiate. So I have this before my instrument rack and I have one button here on my controller and it switches the arpeggiator on. This is inside a MIDI rack, but really it's the same as just using the Ableton arpeggiator and mapping the on off button. So what I can do with that is if it's off, I can play a sound. <laughs> And then at any time I can start arpeggiating that. And I also have control over the rate for that. So that's just this plain old arpeggiator device. Um, yeah, I have used the looper in real time um, with live um, or with live performers. You mean like with other live performers or just in a live performance set? Um, I use it. Yeah, I, I use this quite a lot in my set. Um, it's sometimes it's it can be a scary thing. You need to get used to it a little bit. Sometimes it, it doesn't. It seems like it doesn't get the timing always exactly correct, especially if you use it on a bus and especially if you have complicated time signatures and stuff. Um, that's why like, I wanna still implement this in my set on, on separate tracks, but for now I'm, I'm sort of using it mostly on, on the things that I play myself because there I have a lot of control of what I play. And if I don't like the loop that I record, I can instantly clear it and, and move it away. It doesn't interfere with everything that's that's going on, on, on like the background. Um, um, yeah, it would be, I've seen this, um, hey. Oh, hey, hello. no, keep, keep going. I have a question then for you. Once you, once you... <laughs> yeah, I heard, I heard part of the question, but um, yeah, I'd um, ask, what, what's his, what's his name? Eskmo, Eskmo, he uses that a lot. He uses a, basically Ableton with a bunch of loopers and then he records a lot of things live and then he lets that loop and, the, and this way the set sort of grows. I think if you do experimental stuff or sort of live jamming, I think the looper is gonna be 
very handy for me i i already have these sort of songs that i want to go through so there's not a lot of looping going on in general um so that's that's why i mostly use it for my piano parts or sound parts um so one thing i know you were talking about the effects racks earlier and uh i think one of the main points that you brought up which is something that you know i've heard from a lot of people is when creating effects racks, that's really what makes you stand apart. Obviously, the, the music that you're playing makes you stand apart, but the effects racks themselves. When you, if someone's just starting to perform with Ableton Live, how do you recommend approaching that? Do you recommend getting all of the music and the sounds in the session first and, and separating the process and building effects racks then after that? or? building effects racks while you are loading in your performance clips? Yeah, for me, um, I usually, I do this with production as well. I usually separate that qu quite clearly. So I have the time where I do like creative stuff and then more technical stuff and, and splitting everything into clips. Um, I would advise maybe first to, to well, that, at the first step to get your tracks, then decide how you want to split them up in stems, then load them here. And that's like the first, maybe start with one song first, and then you can maybe make some effect racks or maybe start with somebody else so that you can sort of get a feel for it. And then what I would do is, or what I did is I really spent some time like finding cool tricks. And some of them I also know from production. So I might know I have, for example, my master here, I have a very weird effect, which is by cable guys it's called uh, shaper box and it can do a lot of mad stuff and it's it's something that i found in in production and then when i'm making the effect rack i think hey wait maybe that that plugin could do something cool here so it's and that also it, it, it's sort of a combination of the the things that you already know from production so if you have a certain trick or sound design thing that you really like um, I would definitely implement that in that rack because that's that's going to be your sound, like your idea. It could be a combination of plugins, like um, to give a pew away a ring modulation on a on a reverb, for example, creates interesting tones, or a looper with the resonator after it, so that you can pitch the loop and stuff like that. Um, that that you find in production, maybe, um, but then that you can use in your live set as well. Um, and if you don't like have any of those tricks or you're really new to production, I would really like just try experiment with plugging, like take time for that. It's not, it's not only a thing that you want to sound and then you, and then you try a certain thing and then you think, okay, that doesn't work and you, you move on. I would really sort of set time apart just as you would learn piano or a guitar and, and learn like a certain category maybe of plugins like phases and flangers and really see what they can do and, and which kind of different tones you can get out of them. I think from that you can gain a lot of well, both experience but also you, you can get a good sense of, of what your sound is and things that you like and not. Yeah, so um, do, you, do you feel it's it's important uh, just hearing you kind of talk about that, do you feel it's important to have at least a good base foundation in being able to produce music and produce music within live before performing with it? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know if there's a strict answer to that. Um, it's nice because you can perform your own music, but you can, I like I've talked with some DJs that, that have never made a song, but they really know what flangers and that kind of things do. So, so it's also really what you want to do at the, at the end of the day, you just want to have fun with this stuff. And, and if you like to use like pre-made stems and, and presets and loops, and you want to throw them together and get like a cool thing going live, I would say definitely go for it and, and you'll learn the effects along the way. I think as, as long as you're interested in something that's that's going to make you skilled in it because the interest is, is what drives your it's, it's sort of what, what what motivates you and it's what lets you discover all these things so as soon as you like in production of course there's a lot of different things and in live performance as well there's so many areas like for for me I really like playing a keyboard I think that's a really fun part so that automatically makes you steer into that direction and, and then you'll um, you'll learn the things that you need to know to do what you want to want to do. Um, 
So as another question, I see what's the difference between this style of looping as compared to arrangement of view on a loop and recording new tracks. Um, yeah, um, well, there's it it quite a lot. Of, mostly it's, it's practical differences. Um, like the nice thing about having it in a clip, like if, if you record inside a, one of these clips right here. So for example, if I put this in record mode, this track, um, if I enable this, I can record a loop like straight away somewhere here. I could play something and it will record the MIDI notes. One nice advantage of that is that you still have access to the MIDI notes, for example, so you could change things if you made a mistake, although that's mostly not what you want to do live, but um, that's that's one kind of a difference. Um, but there are also things that I cannot do, like I, I cannot suddenly reverse this because for that it has to be audio. Um, so yeah, both both have their benefits. I think this one is a little bit more complicated to get started with, like. Uh, recording inside the session window. One downside of it is that every time you practice your live set, you end up with these new new clips. So if you want to practice it again, you need to sort of clear the stage. And with the looper, it's very easy to to clear everything right away, and you, and your live set always um, stays consistent. Need help with a mix, music theory, or production in Logic, Ableton Live, or Pro Tools? Book a mentor session with one of our knowledgeable industry professionals today at peermind.com.